Okay. So yeah, let's just start in one minute. And then how long do I go for? So are we live on YouTube? Yes. Now? Yes. I told everyone that we'll be starting in one minute. Okay. Yep. So, so yeah. hi everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, so, I guess uh, YouTube live streaming is also on. Uh, we'll start the second lecture, uh, which is a continuation of the first lecture, and also uh, Dr. Kabowski alluded to some of the first lecture events in his seminar earlier today. So, we'll get some of those references as well. So let me just uh, lead, open the floor for the next one. Thank you very much for having me back. Um, I'm going to uh, continue uh, with some things. What I plan to get to the last lecture, the first thing is fitting the data. And so I'll go over that, talking about persistent non homotonicities And then there was a question uh, in the, um, uh, there were questions about open economy what happens in an open economy. And so I'll talk about that. Then we'll talk about uh, agricultural productivity gaps, which are most important for the agricultural productivity puzzle, most important for low-income countries. Talk a bit about industrialization and deindustrialization, and then finally, uh, service economies. And again, this will be like a review of, of um, recent publications in this area. <clears throat> I didn't update it. Um, I didn't move the persistent non homotonicities So we kind of went over that actually at the end of the last um, talk, uh, which is that there's um, pickle preferences, which is Timo Goldparts. And then there's uh, non homothetic CES preferences. And uh, they're both ways of getting sort of persistent uh, non homothetics Remember that the generalized stone gearing, we had these constants, um, only um, those disproportionately mattered at low income levels. So we want non homothetics to kind of continue as the economy gets richer. And um, those are the two ways. And I did, I did show you the fits uh, at the end of the last lecture. So that's maybe why I didn't move it over. Uh, but I plan on talking about it. Um, the, the fit is much, much better uh, with these uh, non homothetic CES uh, preferences. And uh, the non homothetic CES preferences have this advantage that they can be, they can um, have as many sectors as you want into those preferences. So if you want to do an analysis like I've been focusing on about agriculture, manufacturing, and services, you can do that. But if you want to do a disaggregate, analysis and fit, uh, you can use those preferences for that as well. So I guess I'm skipping this first part about persistence and homotonicities, and I'm going to go to the open economy, uh, thinking about the further forces. In the closed economy, what we discussed the last time, the driving forces of structural change are uh, non-homothetic preferences, uh, biased productivity growth, and distortions and or endowments. Um, in an open economy, trade can be a source of diversion, I shouldn't say diversion, more like deviation between production and consumption. The measures of production are either the outputs of production value added or the inputs of production labor. 
and then um, you know consumption. So what you produce doesn't have to be the same as what you consume. And so uh, Kiminori Matsuyama is a paper in 2009, and there's another paper Wu Yi Zhang in 2000, uh, uh, Wu Yi and Zhang in 2013. Um, What's different about an open economy than a closed economy? Fast productivity growth in an open economy can be a source of comparative advantage. Remember, fast productivity growth in a closed economy moves people out of that sector because you can produce what you need with fewer resources. It can become a, a source of comparative advantage in an open economy and a source of exports where you actually attract resources. Um, I mentioned this uh, last time too, which is it's akin to sort of having a high elasticity of substitution. That in, in, on some level, you could have an infinite elasticity of substitution, like in a Ricardian model, um, where you're, what you produce um, is infinitely elastic to relative prices. Um, this, it's, these high elasticities of substitution are more characteristic of disaggregate industries than these aggregate sectors. When you think about agriculture, manufacturing, services, we typically estimate very low elasticities. But if you want to break out agriculture into different subcategories or manufacturing, different manufacturing industries, the more disaggregate you get, the closer substitutes goods are, and so the higher the elasticity of substitution. Um, um, in this case, uh, structural trade patterns can reflect not only domestic productivity, which drives comparative advantage, but domestic productivity interacting with international competition and global prices, right? So that's how you determine your comparative advantage. Okay. Um, I wanna say, open economy, I'll discuss this a little bit in more depth, but overall, structural change really has to be driven by these closed economy forces. And you can see this just by thinking that the world itself is a closed economy, right? So the aggregates that the, uh, the resources in the world have to be driven by the closed economy. How those are distributed among countries can be influenced by the open economy world. So then there's a question about how important is trade quantitatively, not just in theory. Um, suppose Yi and Zhang um, show that uh, they, they establish this fact and then they also build it into a model, trade's gonna increase the dispersion of sectoral value added and uh, labor uh, shares. Um, because exactly, people are gonna specialize in their comparative advantage. And so the, the, some, some people will be importing, some people will be exporting, your, product, your production shares will be different, right? Uh, we know that it's important for some countries. Again, this is the Uyi, Yi, and Zhang. It's the same authors, Kim Uyi and Jing Zhang. Uh, and then it's Tim Uyi is the third here, is Michael Sposi. Um, it's important for some countries, but these analyses are ignoring the role of investment, which I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, given the seminar that I just gave, which is that investment's really important for understanding the hump shape. Um, these are, it's a great paper, but um, it doesn't have investment. And so the hump shape comes out of other things. Okay. Um, then trade on its own can be relatively small, but it interacts with other wedges. And this is a uh, SWIC. So now I'm just going to show you some figures from this paper by Wu um, Yin Zhang and the paper by SWIC to sort of, and the, this actually all of these papers sort of back up these claims. So this is a paper from uh, Sposi et al., the, the paper I just mentioned, Sposi Yin Zhang. And what you see here is the, the variance of the manufacturing value-added shares across countries. And 1970 to 1990, it's relatively flat. After 1990, the variance across countries picks up. So this is trade increasing, the dis this is a, the argument for trade increasing the dispersion. Here, this is a, uh, a, um, a conditional variance. You still see this kind of accelerate, you, it looks a bit more U-shaped, but you see this pickup um, after 1990, 
in the uh, variation of uh, sectoral shares. Again, some people producing more manufacturing, some people importing manufacturing and producing less in manufacturing. This is the a, a, a Uyi and Zhang uh, analysis of Korea. And I want to show you the driving forces that go into their model and, uh, and then show you what the outcomes are. The things I want to point out, these are the TFP series. For the blue is the rest of the world. And, the, uh, and open economy papers are in these, are, is usually the, a single country trading with the rest of the world. That's what this paper is. Um, so in terms of uh, agricultural TFP, Korea has slightly faster growth than the rest of the world, but not dramatically so. In terms of services, it, you see, again, slightly faster, but not dramatically so, and, and much lower levels for both of those. But when it comes to manufacturing TFP from 1970 to 2005, much faster growth in manufacturing TFP than, uh, than in the rest of the world. And that's going to become a source of comparative advantage for, um, for Korea. The second thing that happens, and these are the trade costs, and these two, the green and the black, are the costs of trade from Korea to the rest of the world. This is in agriculture, and this is in uh, manufacturing. And you see those trade costs uh, going down. Okay? So it's becoming easier for Korea to export uh, over time. Um, what happens? Korea starts importing more. They, the, this is model and data, but they, they, map, they match each other relatively well. Um, they start importing agriculture uh, over time and not importing any additional manufacturing, but they start uh, exporting um, more manufacturing over time and not exporting agriculture. Okay? So services are largely non-tradable. I mentioned that. It's not always true, but for many uh, services, we think of that sector as being non-tradable. So if you're going to be exporting manufacturing, you're either going to be having trade um, uh, trade uh, imbalances, or you're going to be importing food. And I think Korea has both of them, but you see this uh, import of food. This is what it means uh, the, you know, in the data as well as in the model. This is what it means for structural transformation. So they have this is the, um, this is the impact of openness on structural transformation. So the red lines are the data. The blue line is the open economy model. And the gray line is the closed economy model. And uh, on the top, you see output shares. On the uh, bottom, you see labor shares. They're calibrating to the labor shares. Um, but both of these are of interest. And what you see is that the, in the open economy model, by construction, because this is what they've calibrated to, you see that the, um, you know, they, they match uh, things fairly well. You get this big decline in a fraction of labor and a fraction of output in agriculture. You don't really get much of a hump shape. Some of the hump shape you get in labor, not really much of a hump shape in output. But again, the model tracks the data reasonably well. And then you get this uh, increase in services in the model and in the data. Now, the gray line, you see that, in fact, without opening to trade, you wouldn't have gotten this big acceleration in manufacturing. Because the acceleration in manufacturing is from Korea exporting manufacturing and importing agriculture. You don't get nearly the drop in agriculture. Okay? So this is showing you the importance of trade in the um, uh, Korean context. Um, okay. This is the Suyeki thing, which is... <laughs> I'm not sure this makes sense. I mean, this is a tough table to read. <laughs> this is showing you that the interaction of trade and wedges matters a bunch. So what he's done is he's created this table by turning off different things in a model that's trying to explain uh, a, a large, I think it's about 35, maybe 55 countries in the world and their structural change patterns. And um, productivity. The bias productivity is the single biggest factor. 
that gives you 43%. Uh, the non homothetics and uh, productivity gets you 70%. The full model gets you 100%. Okay? And here you see that moving, adding trade to a model with productivity biases and non homothetics actually mo move you a step backwards. Adding wedges doesn't really change much, but doing both of them, either you know, wedges and trade or trade and wedges, gets you an extra 30%. And so this is that the, the wedges and the trade uh, interact to uh, explain structural transformation patterns. Um, OK. So that's, that's it for these additional sources in open economy. So, yeah, but Sorry, just for clarification, so here the wedge means the difference of the endowment. What's that? The, the wedge in this figure, it means uh, the difference of the endowment between the countries? They could reflect um, differences in endowments. What they, what they are is basically, uh, it'll be actually very clear, because I'm going to give you a concrete example in the, um, in the next topic. But remember that there's, there's differences in relative productivities across sectors. And so you say, well, why would somebody work in agriculture uh, when they could be much more productive in, in manufacturing? There has to be some sort of a distortion that keeps them in. And so this is sort of like a black box way of saying we see this gap in productivities. Uh, these, th there's uh, some, some sort of a distortion. You could imagine it's something about an endowment, but it could also be a tax. It could be some other sort of a friction uh, that prevents people from moving from agriculture to uh, manufacturing in the example that I said. Does that make sense? Uh, I thought it's a model-based statement, but it sounds like it's not. It What's it? I thought that the wedge is coming from like models, so I thought like there is some like, specific mechanism behind you. I, I should like, yeah, wait until. To yeah, see. so I didn't actually present the model here, but those are sectoral wedges. If that, I don't know if that helps you. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so the agricultural productivity gap, uh, we'll do it APG. There's a, this is called the agricultural productivity puzzle which is poor countries have a lot of labor in agriculture, and they're particularly bad at producing agricultural goods. And so you say, well, why, why do they have all their workers in agriculture? That's the puzzle. One is to say, well, they're poor and they need food. But especially if you think, think uh, food is tradable, you, you could, it's, it doesn't answer it because you could produce manufacturing goods, sell the manu export the manufacturing goods, and import the food at a cheaper price. There's just gains uh, to trade from comparative advantage. Um, that leads a lot of people to think that there's, you know, trade isn't so easy in food uh, for poor countries. Um, here's what the agricultural productivity gap is. It's related to these relative productivities that I showed you yesterday. Take the value added in non-agriculture per worker in non-agriculture. So this is productivity in non-agriculture and divide by productivity in agriculture. For the explanation that resources should be able to move, and if we have constant returns to scale, marginal products are the same as uh, average products, that the simple theory implies that this should equal one. Um, average product in each sector should be equal. As if it were higher in agriculture, you would move to agriculture. If it were lower, you'd move to non-agriculture. Uh, in practice, when we look at the data, this um, averages about three. So it's obviously not one. It's much larger, which means that um, non-agriculture is three times as productive in terms of value, revenue product, as agriculture, okay? And that's a, a huge puzzle, why workers would be in a sector where on average they're three times less uh, 
you know, they're only a, a third as productive as in non-agriculture. Moreover, if you look at the poorest countries, that gap opens up to be even larger. So in the poorest quartile of countries, the agricultural productivity gap is 5.4. So again, how would you explain it? You'd have to say that there's some wedge that's preventing a sizable wedge that's preventing people from moving from, non -agri from agriculture into non-agriculture, right? Okay. What could these wedges reflect? This is connected to what I talked about uh, last time where we had the, what's, you know, the difference between value-added shares and labor shares, because these are just the ratios. It could reflect human capital differences across sectors. That if um, each worker in non-agriculture has three times as much human capital as the worker in agriculture, as they're educated or more experienced or you know, whatever it is, you then in terms of value added per unit of human capital, this would be equalized at one. Does that make sense? The second uh, thing it could reflect is a difference in hours across sectors. So this is value added per worker. But if uh, people in non-agriculture have to work three times as long as people in agriculture, and value added per hour could still be um, the same. Does that make sense? Okay. Could be something about measurement error in national accounts. We're either mismeasuring this value added in agriculture or maybe the labor in agriculture. Uh, the hours differences is much more about mismeasuring the labor in agriculture. But you might think that we don't estimate all of the value added um, that uh, comes from, is produced in agriculture. Uh, so, you know, maybe the people that are producing in agriculture in poor countries are consuming most of what they're producing if you think that doesn't get uh, built into the numbers. In fact, it does get built into the numbers because they don't try to see what you sold. They look at your land and they look at yields and they multiply air, land areas by yields to construct the national accounts. But, but um, that's another, you know, in principle, it's another possibility. Um, uh, another one is difference in labor share across sectors. So maybe average product is the same, but marginal, I mean, is different, but marginal products are the same. Because this idea of no arbitrage really says the marginal product, the wage that I would get in either sector, is I should be indifferent to the two wages, which if in a competitive labor market means that I should be, you know, the marginal product should be equalized. And if labor share differs across sectors, that could produce a gap between uh, marginal products and average products of labor. And finally, and this is the real reason that this is a, a uh, topic of great interest, it could reflect distortions, some source of inefficiency and misallocation. So again, the, the, um, the process that I'm proposing is that you measure this wedge, it's kind of like a diagnostic, and then you have to try to think about what could be the underlying thing that's really driving this black box wedge, uh, what types of policies or what types of frictions or market failures or whatever could this reflect? But um, that's why people are, because if this really means that if I take a worker from uh, agriculture and move them to non-agriculture and their productivity increases by 5.4%, the potential gains, aggregate gains and distributional gains of moving workers um, could be huge. So these distortions lead to additional great, okay, this is what I just said, moving out of workers. And then kind of, when you think about policy, it might justify concern for like infrastructure, urban migration, rural education, because uh, agri agriculture and non-agriculture is not the same as urban and rural, but they're clearly related. You don't have urban farmers. You have lots of not people in rural areas and non-agriculture but they're clearly uh, related. So um, 
if what's preventing you from moving to agriculture, from agriculture to non-agriculture, is not being able to get education, to get a job, you might want to invest more in rural schools. Uh, if it's the ability to move to the city, then you might want to, um, you know, uh, invest in things that uh, promote urban migration, urban housing, for example, or um, things that help bring the non-agricultural jobs to the rural areas. And that's where maybe infrastructure might play a role. Okay. So there's a, a, a wonderful paper by um, uh, my, my uh, collaborator at Steg, Doug Golland, uh, Dave Lagakos and Mike Waugh uh, in the QGE, where they use detailed microdata measurement to look at these possible explanations. What they find is that accounting for hours differences reduces the gap by a factor of 1.1. So it turns out that in non-agriculture, people work fewer hours, I'm sorry, people work more hours than in agriculture. So the, the gap in terms of value added per worker is larger than value added per hour worked. Okay, and that, that is a factor of 1.1. Then they look at schooling. What's the difference in, in human capital? thinking about returns to schooling and differences in years of schooling. They attribute things to human capital. And they see that that differences in schooling reduces the gap by a factor of 1.4. If you multiply those both together, the average, which was three, comes down to about 2.2. So, so that gap, again, one is no gap at all, almost getting cut in half, right, from three to 2.2. It's uh, even more than getting cut in half for the poorest quartile of countries because that gap for the poorest quartile of countries was 5.4, so 440% premium, and it's down to 200% premium. Okay. So clearly, there's a great deal of the agricultural productivity gap that was misunderstood because of poor measurement, and this detailed measurement is helpful on that front. Um, what else do they show? They show that the differences in labor share can't explain the remaining gaps because labor share in agriculture and non-agriculture is pretty close to being the same. Um, and then this kind of final message is that using this microdata measures was really important here uh, to be able to, at the individual level, control for schooling levels and, and hours and that sort of thing. You had, they had to get census data from uh, um, or representative survey data for a, a huge set of countries to conduct this. So it's a very simple exercise, but it's an uh, insightful one. Okay. Next, we're going to go on to the topic of industrialization and deindustrialization. Again, this is just today is just kind of a hodgepodge of, of uh, different issues on these different um, stages of growth potentially. Uh, historically, obviously, industrialization plays a key role in development. And um, I mentioned that I think it's probably the understanding its process is probably, you know, the big question in macro development. But it's not clear how necessary it is. You know, the, the, the wealthy countries all industrialized and then de are deindustrializing. But it's not true that it's not obvious that that's necessary. And it's also not obvious how important that is today. Uh, obviously, some level of industrialization is necessary for you know, a flourishing economy. I don't think you can be a rich economy and not have electricity. Um, you, have to, you have to have a construction sector that's productive. It's not a tradable thing, but you need buildings, you need electricity, no matter what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> but there are some service-led counterexamples. And uh, I left out the country. Uh, this is India. India has had 4.5% 4, 4 real GDP uh, uh, per capita growth for 40 years. That's you know, getting approaching 
miracle type of growth. It's been extremely steady growth, uh, solid growth for a 40 year period. They've never had more than 13% of the country of the workforce employed in the manufacturing sector. And we know that you know, there's a lot of service exports uh, in, in um, IT services, call centers, et cetera, uh, um, in India. And it seems to be a viable model, at least for them. Okay. But I want to talk about the two papers that have been very influential by Danny Roderick. Uh, the 2013 paper basically uh, says that the only sector in which we see convergence, meaning pro productivity is moving toward each other, rich, rich countries catching up with, uh, uh, poor countries catching up with rich countries, is in manufacturing. Okay. Is there a question? No? Um, going back to the black box can just i was just wondering about the agriculture yeah there was labor in that sector yeah and um, there's distortions and black box for them to move to non-agricultural sectors that's what you said right there's distortions i was wondering if it's if it works upside down as well if there's distortions for people in the services sector for them to go back to the manufacturing or agricultural sector because they are more productive in that sector yeah, yeah, so the, you, it's not clear whether the distortion, for example, um, you could have a, um, you could have that there's a subsidy to staying in agriculture. One reason you might stay in agriculture um, could be that there's literally a subsidy. Government subsidies are prominent in agriculture in many countries. Another could be that there's like an informal subsidy, uh, which is that, um, I'm not going to leave the village because I have informal social insurance in the village. And if I go to the city, I'm on my own. Right. Uh, but another possibility is that, that there's something that's effectively subsidizing agriculture, but there's something that's effectively taxing the use of resources in, um, in industry. So like if there's a trade union that um, limits the hiring, by charging above market wages, that would show up as a wedge in our analysis. And that's why I mean that it's a black box, which is we're going to call it a wedge or a distortion, but we don't really have a name as to what that really reflects on the ground. And that's where I think that people that have more local knowledge in their particular country would have better ideas. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Because and, like and I've done this all between agriculture and manufacturing. But you could also have that with services and manufacturing. And in fact, we see that there's a bit of a puzzle in Malaysia uh, because services is kind of the, the resources and the size of the service sector is low relative to its income, and the industrial sector is high relative to its income. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So Roderick has these two papers. He says that the only place where we see the poor countries keeping up with rich countries in terms of productivity is in manufacturing. And then to make the matter worse, he says that poor countries have a hard, are having a harder time industrializing. They're deindustrializing earlier at a lower level of income per capita and at a lower level of uh, manufacturing share. So let's talk about these each a little bit. So uh, the, the definition of premature here is just in historical context? It's, it's just a historical context. There's nothing normative about premature, in which case, I haven't done this yet, but some of the slides are going to have premature in quotes. Hmm. Because premature has a sense of a, of a normative statement. And indeed, the papers cause a great deal of alarm. Um, that's one of the reasons they're very influential. But it's not done in a, like a, necessarily in a model sense. It's not premature in any sort of um, it's only in the historical context. Okay. Uh, what's unconditional convergence? Unconditional convergence asks whether poor countries grow faster than rich countries. Roderick claimed that poor countries don't. And uh, I just presented a paper that showed that poor countries do grow faster. And so uh, there's a little bit of a question about where the discrepancy comes from. 
And I think it's the time series. Roderick uses a very short time series. He also controls for fixed effects in time, but I think it's largely just that we have a much longer time series. Um, the, that's about overall convergence. But um, the second part is about, you know, the, what this title says is about the manufacturing. And Roderick claimed that only manufacturing showed unconditional convergence. I'm going to claim that overall the entire economy shows unconditional convergence. And then it becomes a problem because he later shows that countries are industrializing less over time. So I'm just repeating a bit what I said last slide. Here's his results for the overall economy. And you would like it to be that this downward sloping result that I showed you from my uh, paper earlier today. And he's not showing that it. it's just kind of a cloud. And it's, um, uh, if anything, the, the linear fit is increasing, but not significantly. So that's his evidence for no um, decline. This is the evidence when he looks at two digit manufacturing industries. Uh, so each dot here is a two-digit industry of a particular country. And uh, the initial value added per worker was over here, and the growth on this way. Uh, and he says there is convergence, two-digit manufacturing sectors. I would say that those are the seminal uh, figures in both in, the, in this uh, early paper, the 2013 paper. There's so a recent paper uh, by Bertolt Herrendorf, uh, it's the last paper I think that he wrote, um, Richard Rogerson and Akos Valentini, showing, they're kind of re-examining this 2013 result by Roderick. And Roderick relies on UNIDO data, uh, um, in industry level data from firm coverage. These guys um, construct aggregate uh, macro data to uh, look at um, the convergence. And um, the first thing that they're going to show is that manufacturing has larger productivity gaps than aggregate productivity. And then the second thing they're going to show is that there's no important unconditional convergence in, uh, in any sector they're going to claim. So why is the difference in the convergence results? I'll show you these results in a moment. I mentioned this already. Roderick uses UNIDO data. But UNIDO data only covers large firms, large formal firms, which in developing countries is not, is not the set of everything that's going on. The problem is, and Herendorf et al. convincingly show that, that the coverage in these surveys depends, it varies from year to year in important ways. And these changes in coverage and selection over time is really what's driving this convergence result. Okay. And so when I talked about the uh, paper by Legaco, Golan, uh, um, Golan, Legacos, and Waugh, I mentioned that using microdata was very important for their results. Here is actually using macro data because the micro data is a representative of the macro economy. And so getting macro encompassing data is very important here. Ultimately, sectors do matter, not in the way that the Roderick paper argues. The Herendorf et al. paper is something very different. They're going to show that manufacturing productivity growth is going to be highly correlated with overall productivity growth. So it's true that when manufacturing grows, the economy overall grows. But it's not unique to only manufacturing. It's also true about transportation, trade, business services, finance, and government. Those are all highly correlated with the uh, overall growth of the economy. So this is the productivity gaps. I mentioned that productivity gaps are larger than average in manufacturing. So they have at three points in time, they plot each country, and they plot the agricultural productivity uh, um, uh, gap relative to the frontier here, 
and they have their GDP per worker gap relative to the frontier. And this is the 45 degree line. So if you were to have GDP productivity versus the overall gap, it would be on the 45 degree line. So this is sort of saying that poor countries that are behind the frontier are uh, really behind in uh, agriculture. Does that make sense? This is just another way of expressing those agricultural productivity gaps that I just showed you. This is true in 1990. This is true in 2005. This is true in 2018. There's nothing new here. I just, there's a different way of showing you the fact that I just brought up earlier. Uh, but these are the productivity gaps in manufacturing at the same period of time. And it's mostly all of this is also still south of the 45 degree line. So it says that the productivity gaps in manufacturing are actually bigger than those in the aggregate economy, which is not that surprising for those people that know like the Velasa Samuelson. Uh, um, who did I forget? Velasa Samuelson. Herod. Herod Velasa Samuelson effect, uh, which is that the non tradables are where productivities are very similar in, in services. So uh, it's true that these are closer to the 45 degree line than in agriculture but they're still below the 45 degree. So their productivity gaps are larger than average in manufacturing. This is the point that um, the country, the coverage of the UNITA data seems to be driving the result of Roderick's, um, Roderick's results. So they, here they show average productivity growth in the UNITA data. And here they show the change in the coverage ratio. So whenever the change in the, uh, in the coverage ratio is uh, bigger, you're bringing more firms in, you're bringing the smaller firms in, you're gonna get lower average productivity growth. Because you move from having only the big large firms, which are highly productive typically, to having the big firms and the small firms. So that looks like uh, your productivity growth was low. When you have um, increases in coverage, you get large increases in productivity growth. So um, that's sort of showing how these UNITO data are not the right way to measure things because they can confound productivity growth ends up reflecting coverage changes. And they have in their paper uh, some um, case studies for various countries where the need of coverage expanded and what happened to measure productivity growth. So I say it's, it's kind of quite convincing. Okay, so then uh, the convergence issue that Roderick brings up um, if you believe the Herendorf, Rogerson, and Valentini results, which I, which I do, um, does not seem to hold up, does not seem to be a concern uh, about convergence. And in fact, if we believe my results, which of course I do too, the uh, convergence happens even at the aggregate level of the economy. The second uh, paper, uh, the premature deindustrialization paper, seems to be a much more robust result. And this is, again, that the later industrializers peak earlier and at lower levels of industrialization. So this is the um, take the peak. Oh, goodness. Um, um, this is the income at which manufacturing, manufacturing peaks. And this is the share at which it peaks. And so over here, you see that rich countries, Great Britain, Sweden, Italy, Denmark, Japan, the USA, Spain, France, missing one other here, Germany, I don't know. Uh, they all peaked you know, early in the 60s, but late in the sense that they were rich countries when they peaked, and late in the sense that they had high shares of manufacturing when they peaked. 
Okay. Countries that industrialized later, India, Indonesia, uh, you know, the, the poorer countries, are tending to peak at lower levels of income. And then, you know, these middle countries are somewhere else. So these guys, the early uh, developers, seem to have industrialized much more and for a longer uh, a longer stretch of development in terms of income per capita than the more recent industrializers. And that's a cause of concern for Roderick, especially because he thought that manufacturing is really the only sector where you can converge. But, and here I see the quotes, um, the question remains as to what premature, what, what does that mean to be premature? Because right here, this is just in the historical context. So what might explain premature deindustrialization? Um, there's a couple different candidates. One is the falling relative price of manufacturing goods in a global economy. One reason for this is that not all countries are equal. China is one data point in terms of a late adopter, a late developer, but it's a very, very big data point that produces a lot of manufacturing goods. And so maybe China's production drives down the cost of manufacturing goods, makes it more difficult for other uh, countries that are trying to uh, industrialize to industrialize. The second thing that's different between the new adopters, and so the, so the old adopters didn't have to compete with China. There wasn't this huge uh, mammoth country. The second thing is just that the technology is very different now than 50 years ago. There's a lot more automation, and there's a lot higher productivity, and it's in manufacturing. So maybe it's just driven the prices down. The fact that the rich countries can produce manufacturing at lower cost than they used to be able to, that's driven the prices down for the, um, the poorer countries, the late developers, um, trying to industrialize. Um, a second candidate is that there's slower productivity growth in agriculture among late, late developers. Uh, productivity growth in agriculture is going to drive people out of agriculture and into industry. If that happens slowly, you don't get nearly as many people in industry because you got an inflow coming in from agriculture into in the industry, and you have an out, or manufacturing, and you have, but you have an outflow going into services. So sort of the, the level of the water depends on a fast inflow, a faster inflow of, from agriculture than an outflow into services. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the argument, uh, implicit argument in uh, Huneas and Rogerson's uh, recent paper, I think this is in Restudy, just recently published. Uh, here's a, a figure um, explaining this. And um, here, they're, they use the non agricultural employment share as their measure of development, but you could put income per capita here. And here's the growth in agriculture at very different rates in their model, in the simulation. And it's just showing that the faster the productivity in agriculture is, the higher the peak and the later the peak before people um, drop out. If it's very slow growth in agriculture. So it could be that the late developers, the Latin American countries, the African countries that are uh, not, and South Asian countries that are not hitting the same level of um, of uh, the share of manufacturing, are, it's because they have so, slower agricultural productivity growth. Uh, okay. So then I said manufacturing could still be important. Um, the Herendorf paper has this idea in it. Uh, there's at least four ways that manufacturing could still uh, still matter, more than other industries, I should say. Is there something special about manufacturing? 
Uh, I mentioned Herendorf et al. showed that manufacturing productivity growth is correlated with overall productivity growth. So maybe there is something like a, maybe even an externality or something, that once you industrialize in manufacturing, that spurs growth in many other sectors of the economy. That's a possibility. Uh, a second one related to the to talk earlier today is that um, producing investment is intensive in industry. So one of the ways you grow is by investing. And if you, uh, manufacturing is important for investing, manufacturing uh, or industry might be uh, particularly important. Again, uh, Herendorf et al. paper, Garcia Santana et al. paper, this is a Conometrica, this one's an Arista, both have that flavor um, to it. Couple others, uh, you don't have to produce investment yourself. You do it for construction. That's why I said construction has to be, because construction is largely non-tradable. But you either have to produce uh, manufacturing to put, go into your investment, or you need to produce something tradable that you can export in order to import investment, right? But we already sort of mentioned that, that poor countries are particularly bad at producing agriculture. So they don't want to export agriculture. They import their investment groups. So this, you could think that the lack of it in uh, a well-developed industrial sector uh, hampers investment. Uh, and there's a well-known paper by uh, Shea and Cleanout uh, basically arguing that the savings rates, investment rates in nominal terms are not uh, very low for poor countries. They're the same as between poor and rich countries. But what's true is that the relative price of capital is very high in poor countries, so they get less bang for their buck. Uh, these are all sort of growth-related reasons that industry might matter. And I think there's another one, which is uh, thinking about distributional issues. So is manufacturing important for like a thriving middle class, for example? And there's a sense of that. Why might it be? Uh, manufacturing might be more intensive in low-skilled labor than services. So the relative demand for low-skilled workers in manufacturing, um, and maybe manufacturing jobs are more productive for low-skilled workers than, say, make jobs of low-skilled services. Uh, they might not be more uh, productive uh, for low-skilled workers, but they might be better paying because there are higher levels of unionization, for example, or something like that. And so if you're concerned about distributional issues, it may still be that manufacturing is important for having a substantial amount of income going to the middle class. So if you have a small level of manufacturing, you're not going to have the same thriving Any questions? Okay. I'm motoring things through things. Well, I'm about two thirds done with time and about two thirds done with the number of slides. <laughs> um, I just didn't get to go into detail with the amount of multiplicity. This is something from the um, uh, IMF's economic outlook that I was a consultant on this um, chapter, it was on exactly on industrialization and premature industrialization. And uh, this is sort of showing you countries, I can't remember what the years are from this. I cut it off when I chopped this in, but I think it's from 85 to 2005. Um, I could be wrong about that though. But this is the change in the manufacturing and employment share over that time. And this is the change in the Gini coefficient. And so the countries in this quadrant, which is most of the countries, are the countries that saw increases in inequality and decreases in manufacturing. And uh, these ones are ones that saw increases in manufacturing and decreases in inequality. This is the minority of the data points over here. And then the red countries are the advanced economies and the others are emerging markets and developing countries. And I apologize, I don't know where Malaysia is on this figure. Um, but. but uh, or if it's in it, I think it, I think it is, but I don't know where it is. Uh, 
But so the, the fact that this line is downward slope and, and most of these um, data points are in these two quadrants tells you that there could be some relationship between the size of the manufacturing share and inequality. On the other hand, a lot of these countries are having the same technology. So this could be a lot of skill bias technical change. That's just, you know, all these red countries are um, you know, part of, and then I think if you take the red countries up, advanced economies, there's not a real strong relationship between the blue. Um, that's my sense. Uh, China, again, in all these pictures, China's just one data point. But China's a very big, important data point. China has an increase in, in the manufacturing sector and then huge increases in inequality. And we think most of those increases in equality are regional. It's increases in regional inequality, which shows you a little bit of the limitation just looking at this figure. But we made the figure, so it's just suggestive. I should, maybe I should put a question mark over here. Hmm. Okay. Then I'm done with agriculture. I'm done with uh, industry, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about services. I might finish up early, too, especially since I, I thought I had more slides, but I don't. Um, okay, service economies. Typically, we th I call it a service economy, but in the United States, uh, about 85% of value added is produced by services. So earlier today, I talked about asymptotically the model producing uh, everything in services. The U.S. is getting not too far from something. Uh, typically, we think of services as, with a few characteristics, low productivity growth, smaller scale than manufacturing, non-tradable. Uh, these have all come up over the course of the past two days. But that kind of exaggerates things. The first thing is, when it comes to low productivity growth, there's a lot of difficulty measuring productivity in services because you don't have like a physical unit. And I think the classic example is legal services. Legal services, productivity is zero by construction because the input is lawyer's hours. And the output is lawyer's hours. You can't have productivity. But, you know, I'm not sure how else you could measure legal services. Um, you know, the number of briefs, I don't know. You know, it's just there's not something real clear that can measure it. So that's one part of services that's a, a tough measurement uh, concern. Another part of services that's a tough measurement concern is quality adjustment. Um, things like uh, uh, real estate. How do you quality adjust for real estate? Schooling, healthcare. Because they're not tradable, you, you, you don't really have a sense about these are people are facing common prices. Do you see what I'm saying? And so we can just look at changes in differences in value added. So there's a, there's, a, there's a second challenge. So it's possible that the, uh, you know, the prices are um, less true. Productivity measures are less true. All of that for services. Okay, so that's a big... Uh, elephant in the room. But the second thing I want to emphasize is that there's a great de degree of heterogeneity in services. So as a sector, this is not a bad, you know, the averages of these things, it's all true. On average, uh, manufacturing is, uh, and agriculture are much more tradable than services. On average, they have higher productivity growth. On average, they're much larger scale. But there's a not every service is born the same. Uh, one degree is uh, government versus market provision. Uh, retail services are typically market provided. Education, healthcare, in many countries, the government plays a, a very strong role in that. Um, so uh, that's already a big uh, difference. Second, there's a great degree of heterogeneity in the scale of productive units. Uh, in the United States, the biggest establishments as an industrial sector are actually universities. 
and which are a service, obviously. The average number of employees of services, uh, universities and hospitals are larger than manufacturing establishments on average in the United States. So, you know, you typically think of, you know, a Starbucks shop or something. It's going to be a much smaller scale than a manufacturing plant. But some of the largest plants are also the services. By the way, some of those are also quite tradable. University services is tradable. I mean, many of you studied in, in foreign countries. Uh, so uh, that's that part of tradability. It's true that um, uh, on average, but you know, different service sectors are, are more or less tradable. Um, the skill intensity. You have uh, a lot of variation in how much skill goes into services. You have mixed jobs, like we talked about, very low skill. And you have hospitals and universities, which are among the highest skilled sectors. Um, and there's a lot of heterogeneity and productivity growth. It's true that the sector overall grows slower than uh, industry, but that's not true of every industry. I mean, the, the slower than manufacturing, but that's not true of every industry in the service sector. So I'm going to just emphasize two different papers here. The first is a paper by Dernecker et al. I think this is uh, recently published in the AJ Macro. What they do is they break out services into progressive, what they call progressive services, and stagnant services. Um, they take what's the average growth for the service sector. Then they calculate a pro I mean, productivity growth. Then they calculate productivity growth for every industry within the sector, and anything that's above the average, they lump that into a category called progressive services. Anything that's below average, they lump that into a category called stagnant services, okay? What they find is, again, overall service productivity grows slower than goods productivity, but the progressive services grow faster than the goods sector in terms of productivity, okay? So again, not, not all services are created the same. Moreover, what they say is that there's a high degree of substitutability, a low degree of substitutability between manufacturing, construction, and services. But among the services within the service sector, there's a, a high degree of substitutability, an elasticity of substitution greater than one. So within the service sector, think of structural transformation within the service sector. It's now going to be that the faster growing services faster productivity growth services take more and more resources within the service sector. That's the opposite of a Baumol's disease. And so their paper is basically arguing that Baumol's disease going forward will be not nearly as strong because we don't have a lot of, in the United States, we don't have a lot of um, resources left in manufacturing or agriculture. It's all in services. So there'll be a little bit of an inflow from services. That'll be Baumol's disease. But within service, there's structural transformation counteracting it. Does that make sense? Uh, sorry. So, uh, so going back to the point about premature deindustrialization, at this, so this is about mainly about the late developers, right? The countries would develop later. Yeah. By that time, there was also this other measurement issue, and maybe you referred to that was the being the way companies would split up their services wings and manufacturing wings, that was basically uh, a bigger, like it was more common than in later stages, especially after globalization. Uh, could that have played a role in what we see as premature deindustrialization, where basically, for example, companies in Asia, or East Asian companies, we see deindustrialization, but it's basically them breaking up their services arms in separate. Yeah, so there's a, an issue of, um... Insourcing and outsourcing. If I'm a manufacturing company and I own my own trucks, I deliver my own goods, I've now combined a service with uh, manufacturing, and that could, in principle, get all attributed to manufacturing as a principal industry, even though not, you know, nothing different is being done. It's just an accounting label that's changed. I think that's what yeah. they're going after. Um, the 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 NAICS classification system. We, we moved from the SIC classification system in the United States, standard industrial classification, 
to the NAICS, which is the North American Industrial Classification System. That was adopted in the mid-90s for NAFTA to, to normalize and, and uh, Mexico adopted. That tries to address that in part because now the label of an industry is based on the establishment rather than the firm. So if you have a plant, uh, a manufactured plant in, um, <laughs> my knowledge of Malaysian uh, geography is embarrassingly low, so I'll skip that. <laughs> uh, if you have a, a, a manufacturing plant in Chennai and you have a, um, uh, your head offices are in Bangalore, the head offices are going to be in services as administrative services, and the plant will be in Chennai. That still doesn't really help you with the trucks, because the trucks are going to be done at the same establishment, mm. but it's going to somewhat minimize that. But that is a potential issue. Mm. People have looked at input-output um, input output tables to try to measure uh, the flows and see whether there's whether changes in the input-output structure can really explain a lot of structural transformation. I don't know that anybody's done that in thinking about um, premature industrialization, deindustrialization, because you need to have multiple input output tables, and low income countries typically don't have um, you know, reliable input output um, um, data. But there's a similar issue with home production, right? Where home production is being mostly classified as services as time has gone forward, right, in more recent years. So there's a huge issue there. And in fact, I should have put it this in. This was my first paper that anybody ever cared about, uh, which was Paco, uh, called The Rise of the Service Economy. I put a little picture of it in the AER. Um, if you home produce goods, either manufacturing or um, agriculture, you're home producing and home consuming. That's counted in GDP. Why? Think about, I mentioned how you, they measure agricultural productivity. You take the land, you multiply it by a yield, and you are indifferent to whether you consumed it yourself or sold it on the market. So everything that's produced is counted in GDP. In principle, they do the same thing, obviously using different methods for manufacturing the goods. If you home produce a service, it's not in GDP. So there's a, a difference. I don't know why that accounting uh, thing is done. I mean, that's where home production came in. Obviously, uh, uh, what's your name? Uh, Margaret, uh, oh, she just left last night. Uh, it was a, a woman PhD economist in the early part of the 20th century at the University of Chicago who invented the field of home production. And that's exactly why she did it, home economics, actually, home production, because she said women are producing all of this stuff that's not common in GDP at home. At that time, obviously, market work for women was slower in the United States. Uh, so that's an issue, for sure. So uh, what could, looking at uh, female labor force participation, for example, if the late developing countries uh, have a higher female labor force participation than, for example, U.S. in early 1900s. Uh, that could give us some signal about how much. Yeah, of home that's product. a great idea. That's a fantastic idea. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good idea. Um, yeah, I think I'll tell one of my colleagues that maybe graduate student to do. It's a great idea. Um, linking those two. That's right. Because we also know that women disproportionately work in services. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so now, before it was the slow growing sectors that were attracting the resources, that's the Baumol's disease. But uh, because this is high substitutability, it's the fast growing productivity growth services that attract the resources. And so, again, that's going to be a force counteracting things. So. Um, we have one question online. Yep. Uh, while can you open your camera? Are 
Yeah, yeah, you can you can speak. He's I can see him, but I can't. He's not here. I, I, I tell you my can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. So, sorry, I had written my question online and I thought uh, you know it will be taken by then. But in I want to go back to the manufacturing when you were discussing uh, the results. Uh, of the latest data that shows that there will be no conversions, unlike the Roderick uh, paper. And you've talked about uh, both size and informality. And can we induce from your uh, results that the, that the conversion doesn't happen because of firm size or because of informality, uh, basically? No, no, no. Both of the, no so, I, we don't know. Yeah, so those are um, both work in the same direction. Because uh, formal firms are more productive and big firms tend to be more productive. But the breakout between the two, you know, it's not that the analysis is not so uh, detailed that we could distinguish the two roles of that. But I'm very glad that you brought that up because I was talking about my explanation is talking about firm size, but formality is a huge part. You have to be uh, large and formal firms. Uh, that's right. And, and just uh, another question on, on manufacturing, when you presented the four ideas about uh, the four arguments for, for manufacturing, is, and, and you've talked about inequality, basically uh, manufacturing drives, uh, uh, lowers inequality, if I understood the quadrant uh, That's the right. possible argument, that's right, yeah. Yeah, the possible, ar can, you, can we add a fifth one? that is linked to resilience. In a way, manufacturing uh, outcome is more resilient to shocks than services. So less variability, if you want. So if you have more manufacturing, uh, you have sectors that, so you know, I'll, let's I'll say, say, especially I'll if you say, trade. I'll say yes and no. I think that my, I put at least. So this is certainly not comprehensive. So in that sense, yes. But I, I'm not sure that I agree with the, with the claim because manufacturing is more volatile um, than services, you know, like cyclically volatile uh, than services and depends much more about international, um, the, not only is it volatile, but it's a business cycle for small countries that's out of their control because they're, you know, your Korea depends on the demand in other uh, countries as well. So that might be the case, but I, I also think that that's, there's reasons to think that, that, would, that maybe the opposite would be true. Yeah, but this, I, that's why I put it at least, because these are not, um, these are the four things I could think of when I was preparing this slide. Uh, and so, in fact, it had said at least two ideas, and likely I, I realized there was a typo that I had four numbers there, so there was, I've changed it to at least four. Okay. Any other question? All right. Uh, so that's the progressive versus stagnant service. I mentioned skill intensity as high skill versus low skill services. Um, there are patterns across intensity as well. And this is some of my own work with Paco and with uh, Ken Zhao, who's at uh, Shaman. University. Um, and I'm going to use the US as an example, but it's not just true of the US. Um, I'll later on show more uh, countries. High skill intensive services account for all of the services growth. In fact, for more than the services growth, because the low intensity services actually decline. Uh, that's the first thing to think about. Um, this is in terms of value added. Jobs can be a little bit subtler, but in terms of value added, uh, high skill, skill into the service economy is about high skill services. Uh, these sectors, the skill intensive services, grow and accelerate at a time when college education um, becomes, um, you know, increasingly uh, prevalent. In economies, and this we show across many economies. 
Um, and then high skill intensive services and low skill intensive services, but uh, high skill intensive services are associated with increase in female labor supply. And the idea is that high skilled female workers, when the demand for skilled, I mean, high skilled females, when the demand for uh, high skilled services goes up, the returns to high skilled services go up and they enter the market more often. Because they enter the market more often, they have less time to do home production. And so you start market purchasing the low skilled services, which women also do. That's more of the low skilled women. That's sort of the driving force, seems to be the uh, demand for uh, skilled workers. And then there's also the fact that women have a comparative advantage in services, which tends to be less menial. And so um, brawn differences aren't as, aren't as uh, prevalent in services. So women disproportionately work in the service sector, as I had told. So this is uh, from our uh, earlier paper. And what we've done is looked at different industries. This is the change in the wage bill share over the, the college educated fraction of workers in 1940. And then we look from 1950 to 2000. And what you see is the ones that are growing, where the wage bill share in the economy is growing, um, or the sectoral share of this industry. Uh, this we use census data, so this we we have to okay. We can only look at labor payments, not capital payments. Um, are all these high skill services, health, business, education, hospitals, banking, legal, securities and brokerage, engineering and architecture, other professional services, and the declining services, which don't decline by a lot, are all kind of low low skill services, and they tend to be services where there's a home production um, substitute. Uh, for them. Um, you know, the one low skill service that does grow is eating and drinking places. So this is where McJobs shows up. But, you know, McJobs is small compared to health and business and education and hospitals and professional services, etc. So then I'm going to get to the last paper. I got 10 minutes. I think they should be fine. Uh, there's something called skill by a structural change. And this is a paper by uh, Paco and uh, Richard and I. Um, we define skill by a structural change as an increase in the share of the skill intensive sector that uh, occurs over the course of development. Okay? And by development, I mean real income per capita. As real income per capita increases, the share of high skill services goes, uh, high skill sectors go up. How we define the skill intensive sector is by looking at the most skilled industries. That is the industries that pay the highest share to college educated workers. The highest fraction of their wage bill goes to college educated workers. Um, that's finance, education, health, and business services. Those four industries are going to be the skill intensive sector. I want to show you that this, this uh, phenomenon is highly salient in the data. Both the definition, you look across countries, that these are the four uh, highest skilled sectors, and the fact that this grows with development. Um, moreover, I'm going to, we claim that it, we're, they're driven by the standard structural transformation forces, namely an increasing relative price of the skill intensive sector with development that comes out of the biased productivity, and the fact that the skill intensive sector is a luxury uh, sector. Okay. Now, the way we've defined skill intensive sector is only services, finance, education, health, and business services. But if you add in the next two industries, which are uh, manufacturing industries, electronics and chemicals, those sectors also grow with development. But what's not true is that their relative prices do not grow with development. Electronics, the relative price of electronics has fallen, uh, fall, has fallen with development. Uh, and chemicals too. So here's the picture where I say highly salient. This is pretty striking. Here we have labor compensation. Here we have value added data. This is advanced economies 
uh, between 1970 and 2005, I believe. Okay. This is a regression of one data point. Not, nothing else that you've seen has been this clean. <laughs> this is a regression of data on one explanatory variable, real GDP per capita. And we've plotted it. The green lines are uh, uh, the yellow dots, I should say, are the United States. The green is the rest of the countries. And they all look the same. Uh, I don't know the R squared, but it's something like 80% of the variation. 75 or 80% of the variation is explained by this one variable, which is kind of striking. Oh, I should mention this. We, we do take our country fixed effects, so we get the levels correct. But the changes, everybody's changing at the same rate. Um, pretty striking. Why is it pretty striking? These are sort of um, sectors that institutionally vary a lot from country to country. The healthcare systems in Germany and the United States and France and the UK are all very different from one another. Educational systems, all very different from one another. The role of you know, private education versus public education. Finance highly regulated sector, different. But they're all sort of showing this pattern in a, in a remarkably salient fashion, okay? The value added declines, labor compensation declines uh, in the low skill sector and in the high skill sector, they, uh, they increase. And this is just advanced economies? What's that? This is just advanced economies or? This is just advanced economies. And this is something that I said that we, in our earlier paper, we, we associated it with the uh, increase in college attainment. Uh, but here, it's all related to GDP per capita. So that's, that's what we're looking mm. at. Um, yeah. We don't have these data for low, low um, income countries. Um, but I, I suspect that it's not as strong in, in the moment. Hmm. Uh, this is the, so then I said this is, this is the result of structural transformation, the forces I've been emphasizing over the past two days. This is the relative price of the skill intensive sector over the, non, uh, the non-skill intensive sector. The price of high school over the price of low skill, 1995 equals 100 for all these countries. And again, close to this, fit line. I mean, it's, it's explaining a ton of the variation. Here's the U.S. And again, these sectors are the ones that in the United States we think of as the most screwed up. Everybody says, why does education always cost more and more? Why does healthcare always cost more and more? Finance is always screwed up. Um, I think it's business services gets off a bit free, but it's kind of showing that, yes, it's true that in the United States things have increased faster with GDP per capita than in other countries. But it's not a crazy outlier. And for the most part, this is happening in every country. And again, it's happening in every country despite the fact that these institutions are very different in different countries. So the first force for structural transformation is the bias productivity, which um, manifests in changing relative prices. The second force for structural transformation. The second big force for structural transformation is income effects. Uh, in order to get income effects, what we need to do is look within a country where everybody's changing, because prices are changing with income. So now what instead I've got to do is look within a country where everybody faces the same prices, but you have rich people and poor people, and see whether rich people consume differently than poor people. It's a complicated, um, it's not conceptually difficult, but it's a complicated thing to pull off, to figure out in a consumption bundle, how much of the consumption bundle came from the high skill sector and how much came from the low skill sector. But we do this using micro data in the United States and we show the fact that the high skill is increasing in quantities. It's also increasing in total expenditures.
And so when pushing in, Okay. Uh, the live stream? It's on. Okay. So I just want to connect some of these thoughts to Malaysia a little bit more. Mm. I talked about premature industrialization. But if you recall from last lecture, if anything, Malaysia seems to have post-mature industrialization, which is that its, it's uh, size of its industrial sector is large relative to its income, and it hasn't sort of, service sector hasn't taken off. And the, industrial sector hasn't declined in the same way. So I think there's this question, 
and some of these things have come up and you know is it oil endowments and the oil exports that is the cause of this industrial sector being larger is it rapid agricultural productivity growth remember slow productivity growth because premature deindustrialization i showed you that a lot of people moved out of agriculture so maybe it's rapid agricultural productivity growth uh, is it related to openness is it um, as was uh, mentioned, it could it be, a, a, I think, uh, Augustine was it? No, somebody yesterday mentioned the financial crisis, the Asian financial crisis. Yeah. It's related to that. Or is it related to distortions? And if it is related to distortions, I think then you have to think a lot about sort of like policies to, to address those distortions. So again, the whole exercise here is to sort of look at the diagnostics and think about where we, where we could think more about what might be driving these black box uh, patterns. Uh, yeah. Second takeaway message is that you ought to anticipate deindustrialization at some point and high skill service growth because it's happened in every other country. The patterns are quite salient. And so even if Malaysia is an outlier in those, they're gonna, it's going to happen eventually. This process of deindustrialization and high skill service growth for two reasons. One is that because industry might be, manufacturing might be associated with the middle class, service growth might be associated with demand for high skilled workers and a rising skill premium, might be maybe unequalizing. So that's something that I would project. And so then there's this question about how can, uh, how can the process be both inclusive and high growth? And some potential suggestions um, is to support the progressive service export sectors. Many of those are, hey, did I give you the list of what the progressive services were? That didn't show up. Huh. Um, uh, you know, work for an efficient government sector in skill intensive industries like health and education and finance, where the government plays a big role and invest high, uh, heavily in higher education. I don't think I did show you which were the, and that's a mistake. Oh, here, there. I skipped over this somehow. These are the progressive services in the, in the US. That's what they do their study. Three. Transportation, air, rail, pipeline, and trucks, some of which are tradable, some not so. Uh, trade, wholesale, retail, storage, and warehousing, media, Oops. Publishing, movies, broadcasting, performing arts, sports, etc., museums, that kind of thing. Some of fire, finance, insurance, real estate. Securities, exchange, and insurance are progressive, but banks are not. Rental industry is progressive, real estate is not. Some business services, administration and management are progressive services, according to their measures, high productivity growth. And this one surprised me, but not computer services. Computer services is slower than average uh, sector. I wonder whether that has me there's a measurement issue there. But anyway, um, so those are the type of uh, sectors that maybe you ought to think about um, supporting, or at least, um, again, all these models are efficient. So they may, it may not be efficient. There may be room for industrial policy. But um, so I, let me just open, before I ask my question, let me open the floor if anyone else has a question. Uh, if not, then I'll continue. So uh, let me then ask. So these reasons as you mentioned about why industrialization may be needed, some of these seem to be, have this element of externality where the decision makers of one sector, like manufacturing sectors, do not internalize the this, the benefits of the whole economy. And then again, this opens up this role for policy, right? Yeah. So for example, if you have to import tradable services and for that you have to export industrialized goods, that seems to be done by vastly different sectors. Yep. Uh, so could it be that, for example, countries with a different type of like industrial policies have different degrees of premature industrialization, for example? and more uh, hands-off 
industrial policy. Yeah, that's, an, that's also a really good idea. I'll say this. The first is that the literature overwhelmingly, um, the models that are used, the first welfare theorem homes. Hmm. It's like, a, this is like Washington consensus type of models. Uh, I have noticed both in my interactions with the bank and I've had more interactions with the IMF, there's a huge demand for uh, industrial policy advice from, from ministries of finance, economic planners and uh, economic uh, um, policy makers uh, in low income countries. Is that because there are externalities? Maybe. And this, I, I left it open here, you know, that we find some correlation. Uh, it could also just be impatience, uh, which is, you know, it's a hard, the Washington census is a tough thing. You just, it doesn't work, you just, you're stuck. But it's not clear that you can improve on it. It's not clear that we know enough, even if there are externalities, to be able to, to really target industrial policy well. Hmm. I think tons of research should be done on industrial policy, and that's a great example of, of uh, what might be interesting is to see, looking at variations in industrial policy, how they uh, affect structural transformation. The work that I know that's uh, the, uh, being done on this is really being done on the Korean experience. Because Korea did do a lot of industrial policy of various fronts, credit, um, subsidies, uh, industrial organization, lots of different things. And obviously, Korea has industrialized in a dramatic fashion. So there is research that's occurring um, for Korea. Um, there's also work like looking at the you know, giant uh, Chebu uh, concerns, the big uh, conglomerates. Um, but I think that this is something we, we need to know much more about. And Doug and I know that Steg there's demand from kind of all fronts to know more about this, and we really just don't want it as a discipline at this point. And secondly, so you mentioned Danny Roderick's uh, explanation, uh, hypothesis, and like what he finds in his papers. I think he also links this to innovation. How, why, uh, and this does this uh, somehow, this must relate to the, to the, the productivity growth in. Is it related to productivity growth and the investment producing goods somehow? Because he says that, if I'm not misquoting, it's a, it is somehow for them African countries, they seem to be deindustrialization, deindustrializing prematurely. That could be because of innovation, which is, which has yes. taken away this advantage of low cost production, let's say. Yeah, so this is, I, I'm going to call technology. I mean, that's, I think that in, you're using the word innovation, but that's what I meant, technological change. Now, it, it, innovation has changed the way we produce manufacturing goods, and we can produce them much more cheaply. But that works through relative prices, which is that if you're in um, India and you used to be able to get by uh, based on cheap labor, and now cheap labor is not enough because I can get cheap machines to do it, that, that changes the game. Bit for you that in a way that it wasn't for uh, Korea, you know, or Hong Kong in the 1960s, and certainly not for the U.S. in the 1940s or something like that, mm. 30s. So I don't see any hand raised uh, for virtual participants or in-person participants. So let me close the 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 lecture series here. So thank you very much, Professor Gabowski, for delivering these two lectures. We learned a lot about the empirical work, and, uh, sorry, the, the framework, the theoretical work, as well as empirical work, but also what was nice to see how Malaysia and East Asia overall stand and what the role of trade is in today's lecture. So thanks a lot for being here. It was great. We learned a lot. And um, yeah, I'll close with that. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for having me.